Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Charles Williams and this is Chris Gilmore. We're going to be doing a, a short session tonight um, and just to get you into some of the community disaster response and some of the ways in which we approach it. So sit back and relax, enjoy. Um, and we'd like to start just to transition into the, the space for a moment. So I invite you all just to get comfortable in your chair or if you're standing, standing, or if you're lying in bed, or maybe you're in the bath, wherever you are, but just like, let yourself get comfortable. Just take a deep breath. <laughs> I've had a busy day, I'm just gonna let go of anything I don't need so I can be here right now. You can eyes open or close, just take a deep breath and let yourself settle here. I always like to feel gravity, like that tug, that gentle but lovely tug that is gravity. I like to think of it as a hug of the earth. It's kind of like reaching up and holding me, keep me here. I invite you just to let the energy, your energy, just let it settle, let it sink right here. See if it'll like sink down, like, like if your body became. Uh, you know, vapor and is able to just sink through the chair and the floor and just like sink into the earth. Can you just like let yourself sink down and, <clears throat> and feel the earth kind of touch you? Like go all the way down, wherever it is down below you. Just like touch it maybe with your hands, your feet, or maybe you'd end up sitting on it. Just allow yourself to like settle down, touch that earth. Just take a moment and breathe some of that up. That rich earthy energy, just breathe it up for tonight. Let it mingle in. Go to any place in our body that needs a little attention, a little extra. Mm, yeah. I invite you just to notice what you hear. Let your ears open up. Maybe there's familiar sounds around you. Maybe it's quiet. Just notice what you hear. Notice what you smell. Are there any smells that are in your space right now? Taste. Maybe there's a little left of the last meal you had or something you've been drinking. Notice how you feel in this moment. With no judgment, just notice how you feel. How your emotions feel, but also how the air feels on your body or how your clothes hang on you, how your seat presses against you. Just allow yourself to become totally here for tonight. When you're ready, I invite you just to open your eyes and notice what's around you. You probably know this place very well. You might call it home. You might know everything that's here, but just notice again all the things that you might not take the time to notice. Maybe there's something new or different, or something you just haven't looked at in a while. Just allow yourself to be here and notice all of our friends that we're joining with. I just want to say welcome. Welcome here. Welcome tonight. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Uh, it's so wonderful. Um, yeah, and I really appreciate it. You know, I know things are really busy right now. It's, you know, it's a pretty busy time of the year um, for, for a lot of folks that I'm talking to. And, and I really appreciate you showing up. Um, you know, from kind of a, a selfish point of view, I appreciate it too, just in that to say that, you know, this is a, a topic we're diving into that I'm, I'm really passionate about in life. Uh, you know, this uh, empowering the human spirit in context to our changing world, but it, it can also be a bit of a, an overwhelming topic. And, you know, I often find at least in some of my circles that I, I, I sometimes wish people would address it more than they maybe do. 
uh, you know, a lot of folks I, I try to have these conversations with, you know, just, just don't want to hear it um, and, and, you know, find it very stressful, overwhelming. Um, but to me, it's just, it's so important, you know, and, and I actually find a lot of, um, I find that my stress is alleviated when I'm actually proactive about the state that our world is. Um, and, and I find that if I ignore it, uh, I might feel good on any given day, but it's actually building kind of in this back level. So all of are, are kind of in my, my subconscious, you know, and, and I don't think that's healthy for my body. So uh, I want to kind of start off tonight with a little bit of gratitude and, and say thank you folks for, for showing up courageously and proactively to, to talk about a topic that's, that's a little bit intense and, and can be overwhelming. Um, and I hope, you know, one of my, my goals for tonight and one of my hopes for tonight is that you come out of tonight not feeling overwhelmed, but feeling actually inspired and empowered um, and feeling connected to, to possibility. So that's that's one of my hopes for tonight. Um, and I'll, I'll continue to extend that gratitude. You know, Charles did that beautiful um, kind of sense meditation for us this morning and, and brought us down to the earth there. And, um, you know, I just want to extend a, a gratitude just for all the beings of this ecosystem that support us. Um, you know, I'm so thankful to live in a land where we, we have trees and clean water that I can drink, you know. Um, and that there's there's deer and wolves and all these wonderful animals moving around out around me right now. So uh, I want to extend a little bit of gratitude to just all the, yeah, the ecology of our planet uh, and the way that it supports and holds us. And uh, I'd also like to, you know, on this theme of, of disaster response and preparedness, I'd like to extend a gratitude out to the lineages of people um, that have supported each other and have done their best to tend to the earth throughout the ages. And, you know, I, I personally, where I live, I mentioned, I think, for some of you that were on at the beginning, I live uh, up on the edge of this place called Algonquin Park. Um, and Algonquin Park is named after one of the Anishinaabe uh, Indigenous nations around here, the, the Algonquin peoples. Um, and I've, I've been fortunate to work a lot with uh, a number of different communities within the Anishinaabe nation now. And I want to really acknowledge, you know, when, it, when I start to think about human potential um, in responding to disaster and human potential in working with the land in a healthy way. Uh, I know myself personally, I've learned so much from the, the indigenous peoples of my lands. Um, and I've been starting to try and explore my own roots and my own ancestors going back in time over to Scotland, over to Hungary to understand how, how they may have done that at one point in our human history. But to, to tell a little bit of a story as, as part of that acknowledgement and that gratitude, um, I was I was overdoing a teaching on this island once here in, in uh, Nishinaabe territory. It was with a Chippewa community. And uh, one of the ladies doing a teaching that day, um, you know, told the story about basically a, a disaster that happened on their in their community where a community member went through the ice in their vehicle. And uh, she told this beautiful, as sad and as devastating as this experience was, she told this beautiful story of the community rallying together. And, you know, within 20 minutes of this vehicle going through the ice, uh, they had search and rescue teams out looking for people that were missing. Uh, they had a team getting ready to dive down to try and go rescue the vehicle and the person. Uh, they had people getting ready to do grief counseling for the family. They had people making food. And I, I was just like, it was mind blowing to think that this community was able to rally so quickly, all going from their busy day to day, whatever. And just like instantly the whole community rallied around this experience. And um, I, won't, I won't share any more details than that of the story because I don't believe it's mine to share. Um, but what, what I wanted to acknowledge is just, you know, the, this, the spirit in these people, because these weren't EMS workers, they weren't government workers, they weren't FEMA, they weren't Red Cross, they were just the people of the community. They were teachers, they were parents, they were, you know, uh, snow truck drivers, they were all those different people. And when this disaster came up, they just rallied in the most beautiful and connected way. And it was really interesting because the, the second part of the story is she kind of contrasted it with when the police showed up across the island. And, is, and although they came over with such good intention, um, you know, they came in and instantly were asking these people that were going through this, for one, they had things under control. And two, um, they, they were going through this intense grieving process because somebody did actually pass away. And the police came in, very, very good intention. 
but started to want to take control away from the community and do everything by the book and wanted to start taking notes and started wanting to ask everybody a million questions. And it was really interesting, just this contrast between this indigenous community response to disaster, grassroots community response to disaster, and then this kind of top down approach that that we're used to. Um, and you know, I'm not I'm not wanting to rip on the you know the police department in any way, shape, or form. But what I am wanting to do is just acknowledge, uh, you know, this this ancient wisdom amongst peoples. You know, since the beginning of time, we have faced adversity. You know, ice ages have come and gone. Uh, climate change has come and gone. Drought has come and gone in regions, um, and people have actually lived through it and they've adapted and they've come together as communities long before we had things such as EMS or uh, you know Red Cross or FEMA. Um, so I wanted to take this moment just to kind of one acknowledge the human spirit in all of our ancestry and our ability to step up to adversity, and then two really acknowledge the the wisdom that comes from the First Nations people of these lands and and you know what they're um, yeah what what we have the ability to learn if we are able to form healthy relations today uh, with these peoples. Um, it makes me think a little bit. There's a girl, Carrie Ann Charles. She's actually going to be part of a program um, that Charles and I are running this winter. Uh, it's called Creating Community Resilience. Uh, and Cherry, uh, Carrie Ann is uh, from this community. And she was just recently um, over in wherever the latest um, United Nations climate change talk were as an Indigenous representative of bringing Indigenous perspective. So there's also a piece to celebrate here. Uh, and that, you know, is although we have a lot of work to do in, in healing the wrongs that have been done to Indigenous people, I also feel like I'm starting to see um, some, some honest effort moving forward to, to bring that Indigenous voice back into the conversation and to break down those, those barriers of oppression. So um, in, in starting off our call tonight, I, I just wanted to uh, honour the Indigenous peoples of this land, the Indigenous spirit, and honour uh, that part of all of us um, that, that comes from actually really resilient people throughout, throughout the ages. Um, there's one other layer that I want to just name in there, uh, and that's also this piece around the tending of the lands of peoples over time. You know, I was in my early 20s when I first started studying ecology. I had na naively always thought of the, the forests of the north of me, Algonquin Park and north as these wild virgin forests. And as I learned more about the history and, and a lot through my relations with some of the Indigenous communities that I've been fortunate enough to work with, I learned that you know, these, these aren't actually virgin forests. They've been tended by people for thousands of years and they've been tended by wildlife for thousands of years. And the way that they tended actually was the first step in mitigating and preventing disasters in the first place, you know? Um, whether it's the indigenous traditions of burning lands um, to regenerate the soil, but also to keep back things like ticks with infectious disease and to keep down wildfires. Um, you know, there's all these traditions um, and, and I actually realized that, you know, humans have had this give and take relationship um, with the with these land for thousands and thousands of years, you know, and maybe that virgin forest that's untouched is, is uh, was a little bit of an illusion. And it's actually been really beautiful to start to understand that story a little bit. So um, I'll kind of leave it there for right now. But I, I just wanted to yeah, take a, a second to to acknowledge those pieces tonight and acknowledge the work that still needs to be done in, in the healing and in reciprocity to the amazing gifts um, that Indigenous peoples have been passed on and the, the terrible harm uh, that's been done to them. So um, yeah, I'll kind of leave it there uh, for right now. And let's see, what are we gonna talk about tonight? Um, so our theme tonight is called Community Disaster Response. And, you know, disaster response can mean a lot of things. Disaster can even mean a lot of things, you know? A disaster could be a hurricane. It could be a volcano or an earthquake. Uh, a disaster could also be a family member getting cancer. Uh, it could be, you know, uh, a, a leaking roof in the middle of the winter. Um, you know, there, there's so many different pieces to it. Um, and I hope tonight through our, our conversation here, we're going to take what can be a very overwhelming topic with a lot of different pieces and start to break down some, some ways to think about it, make it less overwhelming, and make it easier to think about what are those next clear steps that allow us to, to become more resilient as individuals, as families, um, and communities as well. So if I was to break down this whole field of disaster preparedness, I, I'd kind of break it into three different areas, or I, I am going to for this call. So there's this one component that's like, how do we prevent disasters from happening in the first place? And how do we mitigate against them if they are going to happen? And by mitigate, I mean lessen the damage. And Charles is going to be speaking to this in just a moment. And, you know, a huge part, I kind of referenced it, you know, a huge part of 
mitigating disasters or preventing them is actually in how we hold our relationship with the earth to begin with and how do we work with nature uh, in the first place and, and so many disasters in our modern times are, are you know actually maybe normal events with poor human design in place so there's there's, there's this amazing opportunity to actually do a better job in the way that we design spaces or the way that we tend our relationship with the land and work with the land uh, as that first layer of response to disasters. So um, that, that's kind of part number one there. Part number two is like, okay, if something's actually gonna happen, how do we prepare and respond as a community? And I wanna really challenge this, this notion that, you know, that we should all just be relying on the government and Red Cross and FEMA and, and suggest that you know, disaster response for since the beginning of human times has actually been a community effort. Um, and we're much more resilient if it's a community effort. So I'm gonna be speaking a little bit about that. And then the last part, which we won't have a lot of time to touch on tonight, but is this idea of recovery. It's okay, so a disaster comes and it, or we try to prevent it or reduce the damages in the first place. If it happens, um, you know, we wanna be prepared and we wanna respond. But then afterwards, you know, I, I always, some of you have maybe heard this before um, that have been on calls with me, but I met this amazing gentleman, Bob Stilgers, his name, and he's, he did a bunch of work over in Japan, helping people through Fukushima. He's done a lot of amazing work on the West Coast. He has an organiz organization called New Stories, if you want to check it out. But he always shares this, uh, or he shared something with me that I thought was really um, mind opening. And he said, you know, Chris, we're so focused on this idea of emergency responders meaning a disaster happens and we have these people that are highly trained to come in and respond and save lives. And emergency responders are amazing. They literally are heroes. We need them and we should be so grateful for them. But he's like, where are our regenerative responders? Because so much of the systems and the infrastructure that we have built are, are incredibly unsustainable uh, in the first place. They, they're not actually serving people. They're not actually serving the planet, but we've invested so much in them that there's not political will or maybe even public will to actually take them down. But what happens when a disaster comes around is sometimes these infrastructures come down, whether we like it or not. And there's a natural psychological response when infrastructure comes down to cling on to what you had before because it's normal and it's comfortable, even if it's not actually serving you or the earth or what's best for you. And he created this, this kind of coined this term, regenerative responders are the people that recognize that when a disaster happens, even though there, you know, there, there's maybe a lot of grief and a lot of negative stuff happening on, there's also this brief moment in time where the old system that isn't serving us has come down and there's an opportunity to maybe build things better for future generations. Um, and he came up with this term called regenerative responders. So I thought that's a really beautiful term. And, and we're going to be focusing a lot. I, I mentioned this course, uh, Creating Community Resilience that we're running this winter. Uh, we'll be going into that last kind of pillar around recovery in, in quite a bit of depth inside of that course. But for tonight's call, we're going to focus on those first two pieces and really just kind of try to inspire people a little bit and plant a few seeds for what's possible within those realms. So I'm going to pass it back to Charles right now to chat a little bit about uh, prevention and mitigation through uh, tending our relationship with the natural world. Hello, everybody. Um, so I want to look at um, you know, pre-disaster um, and even framing it as disaster. Um, is an interesting way in which we approach, you know, an event that happens that is, you know, harmful to something that we value. Um, and a lot of times the disasters that we talk about are, you know, in part because of poor human design. You know, like if you build in a floodplain, you may have a flooding disaster. Um, the flood itself is not a disaster until you put a house there or you put something that you are perceive as valuable in a way that isn't regenerated by the, the process of flooding. You know, like the things that grow in a floodplain traditionally are things that do well there. It's not a disaster. It's actually part of what regenerates them, right? So I want to think a little bit about what it is as a disaster and then like how do we work with our regenerative design? How do we design well so that when there's events that happen, because events will happen, um, so that they're not um, so destructive or harmful? And what can we do? So first one I just uh, um, offer a little bit of a frame. Um, and let's see if I can get this going. Uh, and it goes something like this. So storms and flooding, like what's happening right now kind of in the, the global kind of climate change world is like, we, we're getting more storms and flooding. 
can see it all over. It has these three basic pieces. It has atmospheric water. So as the atmosphere gets warmer, it can hold more water. So there's more water in the atmosphere. Um, because the atmosphere is heating up, it's more turbulent. Like when you boil a pot, it's getting more turbulent. So there's more water, and there's more turbulence, more stuff going on, which means that there's bigger storms and all that water comes down and it hits areas that have lower infiltration, which means that less water is being taken up by the environment and it's being shedded off. That's what caused flooding. More water coming down in larger quantities, hitting surfaces that don't absorb them as well. Um, so that's floods. That's the, the simple math of a flood. So two of these are climate things. Like, oh, warming atmosphere, more turbulence, that's a climate thing. Um, this like low infiltration, this like landscape design where we've like made impervious services, where we've like tilled hard the land and it doesn't hold things, that we've removed vegetation, like that's a human design. And I think it's really hopeful. You're like, oh, we can do something about that. Like we understand the problem. Um, and we can start to plan for it, right? Um, fire, drought, you know, here big problems. Like we get fire, right? You know, the essence of like fire and drought is you get this kind of dryingness that happens. But you don't get massive fires that are in stamp, but you get them when you get more drying. So that whole atmospheric piece where like, you know, more water's in the atmosphere, but also as air heats up, it can hold more water. Like if you think of the air as a sponge, like the sponge has gotten bigger, it can hold more water before it's full. So it means that, that as it fills up, it can hold more water before it drops it. So you can have drier periods, longer periods of time before the rain happens. Um, you get more turbulence, which means it pushes the, the, the rain to some areas where it drops a lot, and then other areas it doesn't get any. So by changing the weather pattern, you get dry spots and you get wet spots in uh, all across the globe. Um, and then you have this other piece, which is the loss of soil moisture. This is when evaporation, the water leaving the soil, is more than the water going in, precipitation. So when precipitation you know, is less than evaporation, you get dry. Like that's just the nature of what drying is. Um, and when you get things drier, there's more things that burn. Like you get a higher fire regime, right? Um, or a more rapid fire regime, you get drought. So that's you know, the nature of the problem. Um, and you know, of that, there's a couple of climate things, atmosphere, turbulence, and then there's you know, this human thing. Oop, get back to uh, which is the loss of moisture, and we can just manage that. Like we, it's very hopeful in my mind. Like, oh, we know how to deal with this, right? So uh, I want to just talk a little more about that. Um, and as I talk, uh, if you have questions, I encourage you to put them in the chat. Um, I might not be able to answer them in the moment, but we'll have some time at the end, and we can bring come back to answers um, and like look at some of your questions. If you have some questions, so how do we actually do this? Like, how do we start to Design for this, you know. In in the case of um, a lot of it's around vegetation, which is really hopeful. Like plants grow, I and mean, we can grow plants. We know how to grow plants. You know, we plant seeds, and, you know, water them, tend them. They can grow. Um, and when you look at things like uh, fire, for example, <clears throat> we can have uh, we can decrease our fire danger in high fire areas. One of the ways we can do it is regenerative agriculture, regenerative grazing is one of the, the common styles. But if there's any way you can increase the, the, vi the vibrantness of plants. So if you live in a dry area, you're, this, you may, especially, you know, I lived in the Mediterranean area. I lived in California, Mediterranean climate. So winter times are really wet, nothing burns. And then it comes to a point where it stops raining and it starts to dry out. And it's drier and drier and the fire regime kind of takes over and like you get worse and worse fire danger as it gets drier and drier and drier, right? So the later you can have the plants stay green, like if you can keep them like more vibrant and green, like an extra month, your fire danger decreases. And if you can have them green up a month earlier versus going so late in the season before it starts to green up again, you can decrease your fire danger. So like, how do we get plants to want to stay green longer? You know, you increase the root depth, we have a more variety of plants. Um, so you don't have just a single type of plant that, that has a growth pattern, like it grows now and then dies back and they have a lot of dead stuff. We have a lot of other plants that can grow in there. Um, by some of the grazing application where you know, you're using livestock um, on the landscape, you can encourage some of that root growth and those plants to be more vibrant. The other thing you can do is decrease the amount of fuel. Like we don't want to like 
ever take all the vegetation off, you're like, oh, we could stop fire. We just pave the entire thing. But then you have flooding problems. Remember that flooding thing? So what we want to do is keep the plants growing, but we want to reduce the amount of vegetation in the dry seasons. You want to take some of it away and then you're still have fires. That's fine. Fire is not a huge problem. It's when the fire gets catastrophic and big, right? So we want to keep the flame heights down. So like, how do you keep the flame height so it's short? You have to have short flames, like firefighters can put out fires. If you have really big flames, like those giant walls of like, like you can't do anything with that. So like, how do you keep your flame height slow so you can fight the fire? Like we're not trying to keep fire from happening. We just want it to happen in a way that we can engage with it, right? So there's all these strategies, like increase soil moisture, increase, you know, plants, you know, decrease the amount of vegetation during the driest part of the season so you can actually manage the flame height. Um, so when you think about that, like how do you start to design that in your landscape? Like how do you start to look at the landscape and be like, oh, what can we do to, you know, keep moisture around? That same strategy, that same thing around like keeping moisture around is what decreases flooding. Now, oddly enough, it's not about having a drier sponge. Have you ever had a, um, like a really dry sponge or a dry white, uh, washcloth and you like go to wipe something down and the water just doesn't absorb? You're like, ah, oh. if it just was a little wet, then it would work. Um, so this is the same thing that happens with soil. Like you wanna keep enough moisture in there. And by growing plants, by having plant growth, this is what keeps the soil open and alive. You know, by keeping those roots in where you have worms coming and going, you know, those micropores. So when the water comes, there's a wormhole that it can go down, you know, that you have a root that has like died out and like that car that uh, what used to be a living root is now a rotting kind of tube where water can go down. So you get the water to be able to go in um, and it also gets shaded by your plants. So you're like, how do you get your plants to grow? And I'm not just talking about like rural, like wildland areas. I'm talking about anywhere in the city. Like cities, it's crucial that we figure out how to get more plants in our cities. Not just because they're beautiful and there's like awesome science that says like humans are happier and do better and like it decreases the air pollution and all that good stuff about having plants in cities, but it also decreases the flooding and it by water comes down, you know, comes raining onto your city. I don't know if you live in a city that's had flooding, um, but definitely I have. I've seen it in lots of places. Water comes down and it all shunts really fast. It hits the roofs and it hits the roads and, you know, everything just gets funneled in into these like massive, um, you know, systems that aren't sized to handle massive rain. You know, like they're sized for what it used to be doing, but not really what's going on now. So if we, we toss some trees up there and we get some plants growing in the city, one thing it does, first thing it does is like when rain comes down, um, it coats the surface of a tree. A tree has a lot of surface area when it has its leaves on, or an evergreen tree. It's a lot of surface area. So it all holds a little water on the surface. So you can have hundreds of gallons that trees are holding just by standing there. So you get rain. So you get a lot of the water that doesn't even get to the ground. It like sits on the surface of a tree. And then, then as it runs down, you know, if you have vegetation, any vegetation, even little, the little curbs, the little spots, like water will infiltrate in there. So like starting to get some of that space in there with living in green plants, you know, rain gardens are great, you know, bioswales, things like that to kind of absorb some of that water and get it into the soil versus running off. And we can do that. Um, so we can decrease that. And at the same time, you're decreasing those things. You're also dealing with this other, like this heat and water thing, they play really well together. Like so another problem with cities is you've got that heat island effect they, where it gets too hot. You get these heat waves and like people are trapped in their homes and it's too hot or like they can't go outside. It's just like, cities get super hot. This is where vegetation really helps. You know, it decreases the heat island effect because it shades um, and it will absorb water, pull water up deeper from the soil, evaporate that out. And it cools. It's like it's a, it's a cooling function. So if you're ever underneath a tree, you're cool because it's shady. You're also cool because it's evaporating water. And as water evaporates, it takes energy. So it cools the space. So by just planting, you can cool a city so you don't have to deal with the heat chaos and you can stop flooding. Um, and this is through planting, you know, and the same thing when you go to a rural space, you want to decrease fire and flooding and these types of things. It's often about vegetation and soil moisture. Like, can you keep more moisture in the soil? If anybody's ever been gardening, you know how important it is, like soil moisture, because you've been watering forever. You're like always watering, trying to get more water. But if you can mulch really well, it can keep things damp. You can really de increase the soil moisture and keep plants green. Um, both of those things decrease flooding and fire. Like there's so many good things. So when we talk about regenerative design, 
like when we talk about how do we design this and this is what a, a number of our courses earth access training we have some really great courses where we talk about how we do this like the details of it um so if you're interested in some of the details check those classes out but the the basic premise is like trying to get the landscape to be alive the more of it's live and responsive because it responds to the environment it responds to the situation so if it um, if you're getting a lot of water, you get plant growth. You get heat, you get plant growth. So if you have plants that can respond to it, and they're gonna over time, if you if you get them in space and you work with the species that are there, see what works, plant things that like to be there, that they're gonna respond. The things that thrive the best, all sort of things that mitigate your disasters the best, because they adapt to the situation. They adapt to the situation, and they're able to mitigate the extremes because they're trying. They're they are are beings that are trying to like negotiate their environment so that it continues to be good for them so so what we want to do is try to get out there and like get diverse like ecological systems in place um and it doesn't have to be huge like you know we talk about these large landscape designs but also like a yard can make a difference a boulevard can make a difference you know your 15 acres your 20 acres they can make a difference i mean when you add it up it can make huge differences but like the little pieces can make a difference and working with your neighborhoods and communities, like when you start to do community or neighborhood design, you're like, oh, I'm going to work with my the, my neighbors. Like you can actually create things that make a huge difference in really small spaces. So um, I'm seeing my time's moving on. So I'm going to kind of wrap here. But the idea is like, how do we design this? We design it by using ecological systems, especially plants with the understanding that animals encourage plant growth. So what we do is we look at our plant systems and we say, how can we um, encourage the, the mobile part of our system, you know, plants that are stationary part, our mobile part to come in and help manage and support the plant parts because it's the plant parts that do a lot of our, our disaster mitigation uh, in many, many, many ways. And whether it's like riparian floods, whether it's like, you know, I live here in Halifax, Nova Scotia, the ocean is here, it's rising, like, you know, the, you know, keeping flood and storm water out, whether it's keeping fire down, um, even managing things like earthquakes. Um, you know, this is about vegetation um, and animal interaction and diversity. So there's lots of good ways to plan around it, but that's how we want to start. Just really look at our human design, look at our human system, and think about like what is, can we do to increase infiltration and decrease heat. That's where I get started. Okay, I'm going to pass it back over to you. Um, and if any that you have questions about, toss them in the chat as we go along. We're going to come back to some of that. So back to you, Chris. Cool. I'm just going to add a quick little uh, kind of fun action item slash challenge for folks coming out of, of your piece there, Charles. Um, I don't want to get into this in, in a longer talk, but we chatted about this kind of one of the last calls that Charles and I did. But, uh, you know, a neat way to get started on kind of thinking about how the heck do you do what Charles is talking about is to just go and start observing what's already going on in intact ecosystems. So if you have a wetland, whether you live in the city or the country, Go down to the wetland and, and just start thinking about, okay, what are the tree species that grow in these wet soils, right? Um, and then do a little bit of research once you ID them. And what you might find is there's certain species of trees that actually absorb way more moisture than other species do, or certain species of shrubs mm -hmm. that actually absorb more moisture than other species do. You know, so if your problem is flooding, go and study the wetland plants in your area. And, and just start asking, okay, what are the plants growing here? And, and what are the roles that they're doing? What, what's the community of plants that grow together? So there's those layers, there's the trees and then there's the shrubs underneath. You know, if you're in an area where, where wind is a, an issue, uh, you know, you're worried about hurricanes, you're worried about storms, you're worried about ice storms breaking things down. Um, start looking, you know, after you have an ice storm through or a wind storm through, notice which trees have a lot of broken branches and which species don't. You know, urban planners, I think most of them probably don't know their trees that well. Um, but when you go down in Toronto, there is, so Toronto is the largest city near me. There is one tree species that's responsible for like probably 80% of power outages in the whole city, one species of tree. And it's an invasive species at that. And my guess is, is that, you know, the urban planners probably don't even know that this tree sees as tree. But this one species, you know, has very, very weak limbs under pressure of ice and wind. And they're all over our power lines. So, you know, preventing power outages could be just a matter of, of removing this one native species to begin with and letting native species with stronger branches. But as a starting point, regardless of your ecosystem, you know, when there's a big wind event, pay attention to which trees lost branches and which species didn't. 
And that's how you start to think about, okay, well, those, you know, the trees that weren't breaking branches, those are the ones I want planted near my house. The ones where the branches were breaking, maybe those are still an important part of the ecosystem, but maybe I'm going to remove those ones near the power lines or near my main infrastructure and have them growing in other places. Or I'm not going to remove them. I'm just going to build my, 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 my infrastructure near the more hardy trees to begin with and away from the ones that are more likely to break under pressure, you know? Um, so, so think about that. You know, when you see a damaged ecosystem, you know, uh, a, a, an old pavement place that's been plowed over, what are the first plants that start to grow there? Those are the plants we want to work with to restore damaged soil. So you can learn a lot just through observing and asking good questions on the landscape. So I'm, I'm going to just kind of leave that there for right now. But there, there's just an, a kind of a homework assignment coming out of Charles's piece is to just start with doing some, some observation within your own community with some inquisitive questions as it relates to the function of species and how that might relate to their role in, in extreme weather events. Um, okay, so I'm going to shift gears a little bit right now, and I'm actually going to uh, pull up a slideshow right now. Where is it? Right here. So I want to shift gears into kind of the first part there. So we chatted a little bit about this idea of prevention and mitigation and how, you know, if we learn to work with ecology, we may be able to do a lot to prevent and mitigate damage to begin with. Now I want to get a little bit into preparedness and um, uh, res uh, response as well. And I'll start with just a little, little bit of my background right here. So first off, you know, I, I started off with uh, an interest in permaculture. I actually found out about Starhawk, you know, a little over 20 years ago and started following her work um, and started going and apprenticing on permaculture farms. Um, and after a few years working on farms, I realized that, wow, I'm, I'm learning all this about growing foods, but I know so little about the habitat around me. And how do I know my farm is sustainable if I don't understand nature? So then I went down this deep rabbit hole that I'm still in today of uh, just loving the study of ecology and plants and trees and their symbiotic relations. Um, I got really into community development and NGO work for a number of years. And then you know, about 10 years ago, I kind of went down this new rabbit hole around emergency preparedness because I started thinking about, geez, I'm really worried about the state of the world, you know, and the more I learn about nature, the more I realize um, that there's, there's some indicators that things are not heading in the best direction right now. So I decided to go and start studying emergency disaster management. I actually went to school and, and did some uh, college level classes and did some provincial level certificates. And long story short, I, I spent a few years actually working in professional emergency and disaster management. So I've worked with hospitals. I've worked with municipal governments. Um, I've worked with large businesses. I've worked with Ontario's Hydro Association doing emergency plans, uh, doing emergency designs, like doing like mock exercises. You know, so we'll do things like an earthquake exercise or like a fire drill with a hospital, things of that nature. But after a couple of years in working in professional emergency management, um, it, it became really apparent to me that there was some really amazing tools and strengths there, but it was also missing some other pieces. And as I thought about my skill set, inevitably, these things all connected. Um, you know, that emergency, most of the emergency managers I was working with didn't understand ecology, you know. They would respond to the power outage, but they didn't know that there was one tree that was creating the power outage. And on top of that, uh, they didn't think about things like permaculture and what, you know, Starhawk and Charles and Earth Activist is all about, you know, the sustainable design piece. So I kind of stepped away from, um, you know, kind of this top down emergency management system I was working in to try and explore what would it look like to bridge these together, permaculture, uh, working with ecology, uh, working with community and people and the best of modern day emergency management. And that's kind of been something I've been um, having fun kind of exploring and diving into in uh, the last number of years um, through my consulting work. Um, so I'm going to share a couple of frameworks this today, because one thing that I find really helpful when you get overwhelmed and stuff feel intimidating is to have a framework to fall back on that just helps you be like, OK, I have no idea what to do. So here's here's step one. And the framework needs to guide you in a logical progression, but also be flexible enough that it can adapt to almost any situation that you come into. So I'm going to share um, two kind of frameworks with you tonight that we can start to think about when we think about how to prepare and respond to disasters. So the first one is this idea of the disaster preparedness cycle. And this is actually a concept that comes from FEMA. Um, and interesting enough, you know, we have versions of this in permaculture. And I'm going to you know, touch on that in a moment here. 
But the basics of the disaster preparedness cycle is we start with an evaluation um, and observing our situation. An evaluation is like, okay, like, you know, the first step that we do when I get hired by an organization to do an emergency plan, the first thing I come in and I do is I say, okay, what are all the hazards that this organization is vulnerable to? You know, what are all the potential things that could go wrong? What is the infrastructure that this organization relies upon? You know, what do they need to keep going um, or to keep people safe? And what are the uh, what are the assets that they have? You know, what things do they have going for them? And what are the liabilities that they have? And to be honest, like that's the emergency management framework right there. <laughs> what are the hazards? Uh, what is the infrastructure you need? What are your assets? What are your liabilities? And then you take those and you basically just make a plan to address them. So that's the next start. We, we put together a plan. And I, I do want to share right now for people looking at this. So this can be done for a municipality. This could be done for a business. This could be done for your community block. This could be done for your family. This could be done for you as an individual. You could take this basic concept here of the disaster planning cycle and scale it to any situation. It could be planning for your entire municipality or it could be planning for your household, right? Uh, going through that process. Okay, what are the hazards? What is the infrastructure we rely on? Where is it strong? Where is it weak? From there, we put together a plan. And a plan is really important, but I always like to stress that plans are theoretical. And when we make plans in emergency management, we actually know they're not going to work. They almost never work according to the plan. The value is in the planning process more so than the plan itself. So there's so much value to creating the plan because of what you'll learn in the planning process. But you got to test the plan because I guarantee you there's things in your plan that aren't going to work. And there's things that you didn't think of. And even after working in emergency management, you know, I've worked with fire chiefs and police chiefs and, you know, the CAOs that do the emergency planning, they miss stuff all the time when disasters come up. And that's why the rest of this cycle is so important. So we come up with our plan and in the course coming up, the creating community resilience course that we're creating up, I'm actually going to give you a framework for creating a plan that you could apply to your business. You could apply it to your homestead. You could apply it to your nonprofit, or you could apply it to your family. Uh, we're actually going to be working on how do you actually, what are the components of a plan and what should go in there? So we'll be walking you through that as a part of that program coming up. But once we have our plan, the next step is you need to organize around the plan, right? So we need to get the people uh, on board with the plan and we need to get any of the physical pieces in place. Um, I'm going to leave that one there for right now. And then we need to actually train the people and we need to train on the equipment. Right. So, you know, we need people that know first aid. We know, need people that need to do communications. We need people that know how to put out fires, whatever the different elements of our plan, whatever the risks are, we need to train around the skill sets to respond to those risks. And then the last part, and this was always my favorite part in emergency work, was doing the actual exercise. So now that we've done some training, some organizing, a plan, let's test it and let's run a mock disaster. Uh, and, you know, if you run a business or if you work for an organization, even a farm, I highly recommend that you put together a mock disaster. And this is another thing we're going to do in the Creating Community Resilience course is I'm going to teach you folks how to put together mock disasters because I've done this for municipalities. I've done it for hospitals. Um, I did a, a contract with uh, our Eco Village out on the West Coast a few years ago. Amazing folks out there doing some amazing work. Charles and um, Starhawk also teach uh, a permaculture design course out there. But we basically went out there and we did a mock earthquake disaster because they're on the west coast of Canada. And it was so amazing how much we learned as a group when we actually did this mock exercise. And it basically told us where to focus our efforts in preparing and being more resilient. And interesting enough, Brandy Gallagher, who uh, is one of the kind of stakeholders in Arico Village, she messaged me after or a couple years into COVID and said, I'm so thankful we did that mock earthquake disaster with you because it actually was applicable when COVID came around because we had already exposed. And although it wasn't an earthquake, it was a pandemic. A bunch of the lessons that came out of this mock disaster, we actually could apply to this uh, pandemic situation in real time. So this is what we call the disaster planning cycle. And it's one framework to think about, but you could do this with your family, um, you know, for your household, or you could do it for your farm. So just, just planting a seed there. I'm just double checking my time there. Okay. The next framework I want to give you is around this idea of preparedness zones. And, you know, this is just a way to think about, you know, in permaculture, we often think about the zones of design to make our systems really energy efficient and sustainable in how we plant our food, how we get our energy. 
So I think it's a great framework to also use for thinking about how we approach preparedness. Because if we think about all the disasters and all the possibilities and everything that needs to be done at once, it's absolutely overwhelming. So what I like to encourage people to do is to actually break it down into little segments. And I think about soil, you know, we started our farm 12 years ago in basically in a sandbox. And the first couple of years, you know, we didn't have great vegetable crops. And, um, but every year we did a little bit of work. We made some compost, we brought in some manure, we did things to capture water, we planted plants, we used mulch. And year after year, it compounded until 12 years later, we've got very good soil and we have very healthy gardens with very little pests, right? Um, so our, our soil building compounds, um, I would even argue exponentially as we focus on it. And I wanna share that preparedness works the same way. I started getting into preparedness close to 20 years ago. And when I started, it was overwhelming. But just by doing little small things consistently over time, I've gotten to the point 20 years later where like, you know, uh, all of my friends joke that, oh man, you know, if the apocalypse happens, we're coming to your place, you know? Um, but that just happened through just being slow and consistent and not getting overwhelmed with all of the possibilities and just staying slow and consistent. So preparedness zones is one way to think about that. So the first one is we have our personal capacity. I'm gonna call that zone one. You know, what is our skill set that we're developing? And what are the mental tools that we have to support our own mental well-being under stress, which is just as important. You can have all the skills in the world, but if you don't have a tool set to help yourself uh, perform under stress, those skills might not be useful for you or available. Uh, and there's ways that we can train both of those. From there, we go into zone two, which is our household. You know, so that could be our actual house, or if you're here tonight thinking about like my farm or my nonprofit organization or my business, then it's what that business or that project. So it's now we look at that and we say, okay, what are some things that we can do for that? From there, we expand out to like our family and our, um, yeah, our family. And then from there, we go out to our greater community. And then from there, we go out to our greater bioregion and some of the stuff that Charles is talking about. How do we make sure that the habitat we're in is healthy to begin with? So I'm gonna give a couple action steps with each here. And then I wanna do an activity with the group. So first one, zone one for personal capacity building. Uh, I'm going to share a really quick story. Um, I met this amazing girl, Emily uh, Ruff, and she's a herbalist down in the state. She runs a project called the Orlando Grief Project that started up after the Orlando nightclub shooting. So absolutely horrific time. And they're herbalists. And as a community, they said, you know, how do we rally each other together? Or what can we actually do as herbalists for this community? So there's been a shooting. Most people would think, what does a herbalist have to do with a mass shooting in, in response? But they thought outside of the box and they got creative and they thought, you know what? I wonder how stressed out all of these first responders are right now. The firefighters that were the first on the scene and came in to a bunch of bodies. And they literally created Nervine packages and um, yeah, basically uh, mental health support bags and they went to the emergency responders and did a little presentation. And, you know, funny little story Emily told me when they did the presentation of the group, most of the group, you know, kind of put on their tough guy faces and showed very little interest. And in the next couple of days afterwards, she said they had a stream of first responders that actually showed up on their own at their door saying, hey, can I actually have one of those kits? That would be really helpful right now. So they were actually creating Nervines and then talking about like, you know, meditation and different tools for grief uh, processing. You know, so an example of personal capacity building for disasters could actually be developing your tool sets around processing grief or, you know, what framework do you use to help your brain function under stress or make decisions when you don't have all the information you need. Uh, I'll be talking about those a little bit in the course as well, because I have a couple that work for me. They may not work for everyone, um, but I've got two frameworks in particular that I use when I'm doing emergency management work. I'm totally overwhelmed. I don't have the information. And when I find myself starting to shut down, I remember my framework and I go into them. And that's how I make my decisions under stress. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that one. Personal capacity building, a great starting point is just thinking about your mental frameworks that you can use under stress. Uh, for your household or your work or your project, your farm, uh, you know, I would recommend some great starting points is cool. If the water stops coming out of the taps, how can you collect, clean and store water? If you don't know that for your house or for your place of work or your farm, start working on that one because water is huge, right? Um, the next one I would think about is energy. And, you know, at, at a very minimum, you know, if you live in a house, 
where you have, uh, most houses have a water shut off valve and turn on valve. You might also have that for propane and gas. If you don't know how to turn the water on and off, like the main intake into your house, I recommend you do that tomorrow. It doesn't cost any money. It doesn't take a lot of time. If you, you know, if the power goes out for a few days and your pipes freeze and then it comes back on and the pipe bursts, you knowing how to shut off that valve really quickly could be the difference between, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of damage and mold all through your basement and having to run a humidifier for a couple of hours and it not being that big of a deal. Uh, I know a lot of people that have no idea how to turn off the main water valve for their house or how to turn off the gas coming into their house. So learn about where, how your energy enters your house, how to turn it on and off. And then beyond that, you know, you could think about, well, what energy, um, what would I do? So if the energy stopped, what would that affect? And then what am I going to do to mitigate against that? So that's a starting point there. And then the third one there is this idea of a communications plan. If the phone lines go down, the cell towers go down, where is my family meeting up? How do we stay in touch with each other? Um, and I've got a whole template for that. We don't have time to get into it in detail tonight. Um, but, you know, FEMA, Red Cross, all of them have templates for family communications. But these are three things that I think, you know, the majority of households from my surveying don't, uh, haven't thought about. And these three things would make a world of difference in a whole lot of different scenarios. Um, and then our last one here, we're going to go into the zone three. And this is where the activity comes in tonight. Um, starting to map resources within your community, you know, who has skills, who has equipment, what services are available, what diverse needs are there out there, you know. Um, something that we did when I was out at our eco village as part of their uh, preparedness training that I did with them, they hired me and I came out there for a week. And we actually held a community potluck the one day and invited all of their neighbors over. And as part of that activity, um, we basically did a little bit of a poll around people's skills, their equipment that they had. But then we also chatted about, you know, what were people worried about? You know, were there, was there a single parent living by themselves? Was there a seniors couple? Was there somebody that had some sort of physical um, limitation? And what we found out is there was a couple of neighbors that lived by themselves and were really worried that they wouldn't have support. And we were able to actually organize it. So, okay, if the power goes out, We've agreed that this community member is going to go check on this person. They're going to go check on the single parent. They're going to check on the elderly person. They're going to check on the person that's, you know, in a wheelchair. So if we start mapping out the people in our community that have some sort of diverse need and have conversations, we can actually make plans for uh, able body people in our community to actually go check on them and support them um, and check in with their families. So here's a fun little activity. I'm going to get this to Charles to get out to you folks um, afterwards. But we basically played community asset bingo at the party. So we gave these out, printed sheets to everyone. And you had to walk around and find somebody to sign as many of these different uh, columns as possible. Uh, and you could put, a, you could make these whatever you want. But this is a great thing. So if you want a bonus activity, have a potluck with your neighbors. And as a fun little game of the potluck, pass out one of these things and have people go around and get neighbors to sign off on them. You know, who has experience caring for the young? Who has experience fixing small engines? Who has a chainsaw and knows how to use it? You know, um, and just having these conversations around the community, uh, I think without doing too much more than that in a disaster, suddenly, you know, you would just start to come together quicker and faster and respond, you know? And again, I think back to that example from, um, the Chippewa community and just how amazingly they rallied because they had relations with each other. They knew each other's skills. And although they didn't have official EMS roles, they all just naturally fell into them uh, when the situation happened. So we're going to do a, a little group activity right now before we kind of close things off for the night here. And, you know, as a mini version of that right now, we're all coming from different landscapes, different ecosystems right now. But what I would like to encourage you to do is inside of your little group, uh, and maybe Charles, if you could be kind of prepping the breakout rooms right now, so we're ready to jump right into them, that would be amazing. Uh, I'm going to ask you to think about what is one skill that you could offer your community in a disaster situation? From your skill set, what's one thing that you feel like you could provide a value to the, your larger community? Number two, what's one concern that you really have about your own preparedness or maybe your community's preparedness? What's something that worries you? So do this relatively quick. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for this breakout. We only really have about 10 minutes. So first, you're going to go around in a circle. Each person share one thing that they're, um, the skill that they bring, 
and one thing that you that concerns you that you don't have an answer for what you do about and then uh with whatever time is left as a group i want you to collectively brainstorm on a few of the problems that people brought up and i want to challenge you you know if you come up with a big thing like i don't know whatever it is you know i'm worried about the power going out for a month and i live in the city and there's no water like that's a big situation there's a lot of variables to that you're not looking for like the ultimate fix in this what is one thing that you could achieve in the next month that would make you a little bit more prepared using that analogy of soil building happening exponentially over time, you know, in capacity building. So I want you to think about the problems or the worries that your group brings up. And then what's one small achievable step in the next month that would actually make you a little bit more resilient in that area. So I'm going to stop my share there and switch over to the breakout groups. Charles, you got us queued up there? Got it, set. Oops, I clicked on that thing before I was supposed to. I was in the middle of talking. Oh, well. <laughs> it, it happens all the time. Okay. I was like, oh, something's there. I need to click it away. So I clicked <laughs> to get it away, and I ended up getting away myself. I did that in a class last week, Sandy, except I actually <laughs> turned off the whole meeting. Oh, like, no. literally kicked, like literally just ended it for everybody, and I couldn't believe it. Disaster practice, right? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Got it. A good thing for that is to ensure that you make a couple of other people co-host and then the meeting keeps going and you just have to come back in. Yeah, I was lacking on my uh, disaster preparedness planning that before <laughs> that night. <laughs> that was a great exercise. Thank you. Awesome. I'm so glad to see so many people's faces smiling coming out of that. So that's that's great. So we're going to, um, uh, in a moment here, just kind of open it up for, you know, if anybody wants to share any reflections coming out of the group for us to learn from each other, uh, as well as, uh, you know, kind of just open up if people have questions or, or want to share anything as well from anything that we kind of chatted about in tonight's uh, presentation. I did want to just take a little bit uh, of a moment here to chat about this creating community resilience course coming up that I'm really excited about. We've been planning this for, for a couple of years right now. Um, and really kind of our aim with it is to um, take this really overwhelming topic uh, around the uncertainty in our world right now and, and break it down into skill sets that can be applied to a number of different situations. So whether you're, you know, um, a single mom that's just thinking about how do I be more prepared for my parents or a single mom, single dad, you know, how do I be more prepared as like a little family unit or you're thinking about your household or your neighborhood. Or if you're thinking about career development, like, you know, maybe you want to work on an eco village or be part of an eco village. And you're like, you're thinking like our eco village did in hiring me. Like, how do we like design this for our community? How do we design this for a school? How do I design this for my business? You know, so I think we're going to be, you know, for people that are career orientated, you know, I think we're definitely, it's going to be really good training in disaster planning um, that could be career orientated, but it's also going to be applicable to the family unit or the farm, the homestead, the eco village. So that's, that's kind of our goal with the program is to take this overwhelming topic and then to give you folks frameworks, assignments, and examples mm -hmm. and ideas where you can take from that and actually apply it to your unique situation. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to be spending uh, quite a bit of time on, on you know, what, what is the application of these things? So we'll be looking at a number of frameworks, you know, whether it's how to make an emergency plan or how to do an emergency exercise design uh, and apply it. But then we also have this awesome lineup of guests that are going to be touching on very specific things. So Starhawk's going to be coming on for one night. Um, and Starhawk's going to be chatting about this really important topic called uh, trauma-informed response. So, you know, one of the biggest challenges under disaster is the human element. You can have all of the plans in the place, all of the gear. But when people start, you know, for lack of a better word, losing their shit, stuff can get worse really fast, you know. And obviously, disasters trigger a lot of deep trauma for folks. So Starhawk's going to be sharing a little bit about this, this idea of trauma-informed uh, response and, you know, how do we work with people that are in this trauma state. 
um, in a disaster place to, to kind of still work together and support each other, as well as sharing about a lot of the lessons that she's had living out in California with all the wildfires and, you know, what are some of the best practices in designing for wildfires and responding to wildfires. Uh, we also have Lila Darwish is going to be coming on. She's the author of the book Earth Repair. She's done a lot of stuff around microremediation and bioremediation. So using natural things like bacteria and mushrooms to clean up toxins. But Lila also works in professional emergency management. Uh, she was working down in Orlando, or sorry, New Orleans for a while. She's actually working for the BC government right now. And she actually does a lot around the community response and particularly looking out for, you know, people of diverse needs. So she's going to be kind of filling in some of the layers for some of us, you know, because a lot of us, you know, are probably, you know, have our own version of a bubble of awareness, you know, I know I definitely have my bubble of awareness and there's certain needs that just, you know, even as an emergency planner is like, you know, there's certain things I've never experienced. So when I plan, I'm not going to think about the needs of those people or those communities. Lila's had a lot of experience going through real disasters in communities. So she's going to be coming on to share from her experience in professional emergency management and how do we plan for those diverse needs in our communities, in our businesses, um, in, our, in our responses. Uh, we've got Carrie Ann Charles who's coming on and uh, she's going to be kind of chatting about her experience. She was the lady I mentioned earlier tonight. Uh, she's a Anishinaabe uh, from the Chippewa community um, and she's going to be chatting about um, her work in doing climate change adaption with her community, Georgina Island. Um, as well as chatting a little bit about kind of the, an Indigenous perspective on emergency response and climate change adaption. Uh, Carrie Ann's an amazing, amazing person. We're working on a couple of projects right now, and I'm, I've been learning a ton from her, from her and I'm so inspired to, that she's willing to come on with our group to, to come hang out with us for a night and, and share some of her wisdom. So she'll be coming on, and then myself and Charles will be there for the rest of the calls. So uh, we're going to be doing some fun stuff like looking at, um, you know, Charles mentioned, you know, plants, plant, plants. You know, but a lot for a lot of people might be like, well, what does that actually look like? You know, so we're going to be looking at actual case studies and projects where people are doing really innovative design stuff in mitigation for disasters. Um, so yeah, we'll be diving into all kinds of fun stuff like that. So uh, I don't want to keep blabbing. Uh, we got 15 minutes left here, and I want to uh, open it up for people to ask questions and to do any reflecting or sharing from the big group. But I did just want to tell you a little bit about this fun course. It's called Com Creating Community Resilience. Uh, and it's going to be starting the second week of January. I January 12th to February 15th. January 12th to the 15th, uh, all online, um, one session a week. So if you're interested in that, come and join. If you've got questions, you can email us afterwards. Charles, did you want to mention any other? Yeah, courses? I'm going to mention a couple of courses also coming up. So Earth Actors Training has lots of courses coming. You can check our webpage. I put some links in the chat. Uh, Resilient Land Design is the one that we really talk about how do you design landscapes. Um, regeneratively, like what, are, what the regenerative landscape look like, how do you design it? It's an advanced permaculture course. So we have two in-person ones. We have a uh, permaculture design course, an introductory course, it's two weeks, and it's starting here very soon. It's an in-person, so you get hands-on experience. So kind of basic permaculture design, um, which will be uh, January 7th to 21st. There's also um, an in-person restoration intensive where we focus really on restoration, like um, uh, disaster response and restoration on landscape for fire and water and, and where you really get to do some of the practical work of it instead of just theory that we do online. And that happens in February 24th, to March 5th. So you can check out all the things we have to offer, but those are ones that kind of tag, tag to what we've been talking to tonight. I'm going to throw, uh, just as we start off the q and I'm going to throw two other links in here as well. Uh, but one of them, I, you know, I mentioned that thing, what do you do when there's no water? You know, that's a great starting point. Uh, I made a, a video recently, or a couple of years ago, sorry, on um, building an improvised water catchment system, uh, like a real simple emergency one. So I'm just going to throw the, the link in there if you want to check that one out, something kind of free there. Um, and then I'll also share uh, a link to Carrie Ann's organization. Uh, mm -hmm. She works for a Cambium um, Indigenous Professional Services, uh, and they do some, some phenomenal uh, work as well. Uh, fully Nishinaabe run consulting firm here in the Williams Treaty. So, and without further ado, how do we want to open this up here? I mean, I guess the first thing I would ask, does anybody have anything that they would like to share or highlight coming out of their, their group chat? We've got Shell and Pei both have waving their hands. Great. You go first, Shell. Okay. Oh, uh, actually, what uh, there may be other questions, but what's really up for me is that I'm incredibly drawn to the creating a community resilience. And I'm trying to organize my life as the 
Charles knows a lot about to be with them in California and and be doing the course from the 7th to the 21st. Actually, I thought it was until the 20th. Um, in any case, to, so if I'm in California, deep and involved in the in the training, is there any way that I can participate on January 12th with uh, with your online program? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to be facilitating it, so I'm going to be doing it so you can just sit. sit so, I, so I can be with you or, or Zooming with yeah. you and whatever my, and that's in the evening and whatever my homework is from the main course, I'll uh, I'll just have to cram it in later or something. Yeah, it'll work out. And, and then it's once a week. So the next week will be do the math the 19th, which is again, I would still be with you if things yeah, go my 18th. way. Say again? Yeah. It, it starts on a Wednesday night, but then it or starts on a Thursday night, but then moves to a Wednesday night because every Wednesday night. Um, but I, but I still be so it would become yeah. to the same thing. Just same thing. and and generally, what what's the time frame per um, per segment? It's a two hour se segment or two hours once a week. Yep. Brilliant. What's the cost? Uh, I can go look that up. Thank you. Next. Wow. Can then, can you see me? Because I, I can't see myself because I've lost the screen. No, we can hear you yep. though. Good. I'll find the screen somewhere. Um. <clears throat> anyway, what I wanted to say is thank you so much. Uh. Well, for these courses that you offer and this work that you do, Chris. Um. You know, I've always been inspired since the first time I heard you ages ago with uh, Starhawk and the group probably something similar it was more e more back in the eco village days and stuff and like how useful this work is and so interestingly enough in our group we were I was saying you know I got so inspired that um this would be such a great thing to take out into the community and sort of teach get some people together in different local situations um you know whether it's at a a church or community center or um, all kinds of people and just talk about this and make it like a fun gathering uh, of learning something because as things change and as we need to learn new skills, we should make it a fun and a community oriented thing so it's not so scary for people and they can see they can contribute. So that's what I wanted to say. So I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Yeah, that was what, Pei, Pe, when I was out in um, uh, working with our eco village on the West Coast, I mean, that's very much we did. We started with their preparedness for the their actual center. Uh, but uh -huh. then once we did the foundational work there, then we started reaching out kind of like those rings I was talking about. Uh, and now how do we engage the community in this? And it, it was a beautiful experience. So trying to plant little seeds of that popping up all over the place is very much part of the intention of this work. Great. Yeah, that's good. I'm going to follow on that one. Awesome. Rose, did you want to jump in with something? Yeah, I think what was kind of cool in our group um, was a couple of things. First of all, as we kind of talked and responded to each other, we realized we had a lot more skills in the room than we thought, um, which was nice. And, and also that you can apply them in ways you hadn't thought of before. And the other thing was the whole sort of the sort of the community bingo thing. Um, some of us live remotely and don't know our neighbors very well. And it's a great framework for developing a friendship because it gives you some questions you can ask and information you can trade. And people always like to, especially rural folks, like to talk about what they know. Um, so so it was it was a bridging um, tool, which which we really liked. Yeah, wonderful. You know, I thinking about it too, you know, I know some people I've had people express in the past that they'd be nervous around the idea of like approaching their neighbors around emergency preparedness right off the bat. But you literally could hold a potluck and not even mention the emergency preparedness part and just say, hey, you know, we've never met before. And I thought it'd be fun just to like, see what different schools people have. And I saw somebody show me this game. So we're going to pass this out. And, you know, the first meeting, you don't even necessarily even need to if that's like an intimidation point, you know, amongst the neighbors, it could literally just be a fun game. But you're actually secretly like, you know, developing that knowledge of each other. And then as the relationship deeper goes deeper, you can kind of bridge the question and be like, hey, you know, I've been thinking like, what would we do if this happened? You know, you could, would we support each other in any way or whatever? So there, there's just another angle I wanted to throw in there as well. I mean, it could be very intentional, but it could also like, 
you don't even necessarily have to mention the emergency part if, if people feel like that could be a barrier or awkward within the conversation with the community too, at least as a starting point. So anyone else want to share anything or have any questions? Coral, you kind of hit my like, you're saying quick tip, you know, what should we always carry? I love it. Lighter, stainless steel, water bottle, tactical flashlight. That's a great starting point right there. I, I carry all three of those. That and a Leatherman is the fourth one I have in there. And I use them all the time. What was the fourth one? Uh, a Leatherman. So a multi-tool. Um, yeah. So like, leather, I use this thing every single day, you know, but it's got like a little set of pliers and most oh, of the my. time it's not an emergency, but it's got a saw, it's got a screwdriver, it's got nail clippers. Wow. Um, Swiss Army Plus. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> a more advanced Swiss Army knife. But I, there's actually been a few scenarios. I actually had the muffler fall off of my car way down a backcountry road. And with this multi-tail tool, multi -tool and a bit of snare wire, I was able to rework the muffler back onto my car and, and get out of the backcountry. Otherwise, I would have been in a mess, you know? Um, so, yeah. I actually <laughs> have something else I'd like to share, but I've spoken a lot. So if there's somebody else who's holding back, please, please jump in now. Hearing none. So um, well, I'm in this sort of semi- I had the muffler oh. fall off of my car way down a backcountry road. Oh. And with this multi-tool- the recording. That's weird. Bill, were you trying to jump in? I just saw you unmuted there. Yeah, I was just mentioning uh, to our group that for a lot of us who live in the country, uh, the issue is if the power goes out, our water's gone. And so uh, great idea, you thinking of a a way of um, getting that water. Some people live close to streams so they could uh, get the water uh, by uh, filtering it through a camp filter system. But obviously for people who live in the city, if the power goes out, they still have water. So different issues, different places. Mm -hmm. yep, yeah, certainly. and it's good to know, like if you live in a place that your water system is made by pumps, when the electricity goes out, you lose it. If you yeah. live in a place that your water system is gravity fed, like they're definitely knowing your like local system because some are municipal gravity fed. So like knowing where it comes from makes a difference. But also how do you store it? Um, how do you how do you have it? Well, that's true. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, if your uh, water system is out, technically you could take water out of your uh, hot water tank or you could take water also from your pressure tank in a, in a pinch. Yeah. 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 There's so many solutions, but I think the thing is a lot of people don't think about them ahead of time, you know, and, and just having kind of mapped some of those can save a lot of stress when you're there. The other thing to think about, you know, people often think, Oh, well, you know, in the urban situation, you know, we have this gravity fed system, so we're going to have water. Uh, but there's been many situations, you know, where flooding or other accidents have actually caused toxicity in the local water in an urban situation. So there are even a gravity fed urban system, you know, you, there might be water there, but there are things that can still uh, affect a system like that, right? So the point that the water coming out of your tap isn't drinkable, or, or, you know, there's reasons why it might not show up, you know, so, yeah. so I do think it's just as relevant in an urban one. But also, uh, all of this is a good way to get to know your neighbors. Uh, mm -hmm. As you as you mentioned, uh, we live in the country, and so we know some of our neighbors, but a lot of people we don't. We see them in passing, maybe, but uh, it's that would be a great introduction, you know, about having a, a potluck over exactly that issue because it could affect everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's true for urban people too. Like, you know, you live in an apartment with two hundred people. How many of them do you actually know? Or you live you live on a block with you know within a, you know there's 500 people nearby. But how many do you actually know? So I think it's good for everybody. Well, in the city, it's a big problem if your air conditioning goes out. Yeah. In the country, not so much. You just open a window. But <laughs> yep. I wanted to share that um, I'm in a, a semi-rural uh, area, a township called Innisville, which is a huge township. And my particular place is out at the end of a, a long peninsula. And within that area, uh, there's a neighborhood of folks over the, I, I'm a relative newcomer being like there for 10 years. Some people, anyhow, a Facebook group has developed amongst, so, particularly amongst some of the young families. 
and I've been involved for a while and it's very active and very sharing and caring. And recently I'm thinking what, maybe a week and a half ago, there was a major, major snowstorm, major dump. And in terms of this huge township, and the efficiency of the snow plows, it's like we're maybe one of the last neighborhoods to be fed. And some of the streets, the, the site, I happen to be on, on, on the main street that, that comes through and, and comes right to the end of the peninsula, but people on the side streets are not. And people were so disturbed, they can't get out and they're shoveling and this and that and, and, and complaining of, about the, the, the township and, you know, and, and, and bitching about we pay our taxes and where's the snow plow? And I said, well, we can bitch about it or we can notice that most of us or many of us actually have snow blowers or plows on, on tractors and stuff. We, we could share the tasks. And if we actually put a little energy into it, we could plan in advance that, you know, on, you know, on odd days, George is going to handle this street and it, it, it could easily be handled. A lot of people got really excited about this idea. We haven't followed through on actually putting that plan together, but it was so lovely to, to see the response to like, oh yeah, we could take care of ourselves. We don't have to, we don't have to wait for the bureaucracy to save us. We, we don't have to be locked in our homes. Let's just share the, share the skills and the resources we have, and then we can get in our cars and go wherever we want and stop bitching about it. That's such an I also think thing right a lot there. of... I also think a lot of times when uh, people from the city move to the country, there's the expectation that the services will be the same. And those of us who've lived in the country for a while are used to things breaking down every once in a while and figuring it out. You know, one of the other big takeaways I took from my work in professional emergency management, you know, it's really easy to complain about, you know, uh, sometimes the lack of response or, or what we deem as poor response to disasters, you know, whether it's a pandemic or a fire or whatever, but from diving into the realm of emergency preparedness and actually seeing things behind the scenes, I've actually realized it's, it's almost an impossible task, you know, to think that we're going to have like this small group of responders watching over tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people that all have such diverse needs and, and coming from different places and like the infrastructure, the more I understand it, you know, to think that it, it's actually, I, I personally have come to the place of believing it's totally unrealistic to think that the government and EMS can be responsible fully for disaster response and, and really do come from the place that it's all of our responsibility. And, and when I think back throughout human history, you know, this whole concept of emergency services is a relatively new concept, you know, for most of human history, communities were the emergency responder team, right? Um, so that that's very much something that we're trying to re-empower with this work. And of course, you know, the other thing here that I think is really important is emergency services spend a lot of time coming to the rescue of able-bodied adults that didn't think ahead. And if, you know, all of us became more resilient and more prepared, then when disasters happen, it would actually, and, more, and we could rally as communities and plow our own roads and clear our own trees, then the emergency responders can actually focus on the hospitals and focus on the elderly folks and, and focus on the root disaster, putting out the fire, or whatever, getting the municipal water back. But sometimes they can't get to the root of the problem because they're responding to people that just haven't thought ahead. Um, so that, that's another reason I'm so passionate about this work and, and re-trying re to inspire that. So I think if I can jump in on that. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't see Ayata's hand up. <laughs> Did you want to go first? No, nope, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, anyway, um, I, I think that we've been conditioned in so many different ways in our societies to not be self-sufficient, you know, to take one pill for when you're ill instead of taking care of yourself and, you know, things like that. And that's not to say government doesn't have a place. It certainly does. But, um, but there's a, a great sense of self-confidence that comes when you start to do things for yourself. And it's about building those bridges so that people know that they can, yeah, it's okay to go and check and see how to turn your electricity off. In fact, you probably should do that because it'll keep you safe. And, you know, teaching people to be self-reliant again. Um, and what you were just saying about it allows the emergency people to come in and take care of the people who really need it. That can be another good argument for, for people to learn these things. Um, and, but people have just gotten really afraid of doing things. I wonder if we don't pass it to, uh, Ayata there for our closing remark, and then we'll probably 
wrap there. But did you have a, I see your hand up there. Did you want to jump in? You got to unmute yourself. Okay, can you, you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, yeah, well, this has just been wonderful. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and I wanted to say that that on on in terms of the you know the last few people what we've been discussing and you know what you've been saying about people becoming more proactive this has been on my mind for quite a while and and i've been thinking of this as a movement like like a social a cultural movement something that is not just something that oh we got to hunker down and do this so that we get through all this bad stuff but it's it's a way of empowering ourselves and connecting with each other and building community and and shifting the the power balance from yes as a number of people have already remarked from just waiting for the government or the the bureaucrats or the you know officials whatever to come out and do something and rescue people and for us to be empowering ourselves and and i this is one of the many ways that i see what's happening right now in the world as being a catalyst for uh, just change across the spectrum, across the planet at, at this fundamental level of where, where we're not just kind of going about our lives with this overshadowing government and bureaucracy. And I'm not anti-government, but, but, you know, we're not that empowered as individuals collectively. And, and this is just a wonderful opportunity to do that. I mean, we're kind of being forced to, <laughs> and I think we can do it in ways that are very gracious and empowering and fun and and enriching to everybody's lives so yeah i'm just really thrilled to have been here tonight and thank you for everything you presented i couldn't have done the closing pep talk better than that Ayata. that was great <laughs> thanks well i'd like to give a big thanks to everybody who came uh, so everybody who's here right now everybody who was on earlier and the, for the people who are going to be watching the recording for Thanks for tuning in. Um, also want to thank Chris for his wonderful presenting and all the wisdom he brings. I'd like to uh, thank the Earth Access Training staff who've done an amazing amount of work in the background that you don't ever see. Um, and always want to thank those who, who do the work, the silent work for, you know, for all of our groups. So uh, special thanks to that. Um, and thanks to the land that I'm on. Um, didn't say at the beginning, I just want to acknowledge now, mm -hmm. traditional unceded land of the Mi'kmaq people, Mi'kmaq here. So I just want to acknowledge the land and the traditional peoples here. So thank you all. Thank you for coming. Um, please come back. Please join us again. We'll be doing more of these, these pop-ups throughout the year on a wide variety of topics. Great. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. <clears throat>